four of us, which becomes a tight squeeze. Mm -hmm. um, I've also got a couple of slides, but I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through everything in detail because we do always avail these to, to the participants as well. Great. I've got your slide there. I've got mine. Perfect. Perfect. Let me just, can I just open it up and see? Can everybody see it? And not yet. Uh, sharing. Uh, yes. Okay. You know, I can see it. Can you see yes. it? Great. Yes. Yeah. Just one more. Sorry. Can you see that one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So, Trish. Can I broadcast? Yes, you can. Is that awesome. Uh, Sipo, can I ask, do you hear any banging on your side from me? I heard it there just for a little bit, just now, but it's gone now. Okay. Let me just ask them to stop banging. Do you gentlemen have any questions for now while we waiting? Anything for clarity? Not from my side, Sipo. And Kim? I think I'm clear. I mean, I had a chat to Henko before dialing in. So, yeah, I'm good with it. Great. Yeah. Well, we're very excited to hear let's, from both of you. Let's see what has to ask, okay? Sorry? Oh, I have a question. Uh, Henko, do you find that a lot of businesses are coming to you at the moment? Um, yes, oh, Sasha. No. Um, a lot of inquiries at this stage but I really think that the floodgates are going to open at the end of this year. At this moment, mm -hmm. people are still sitting with cash. There's still a lot of fat um, built around them that they should burn through. And I think uh, four to five months from now, all of their cash are going to be depleted and used up. And then in our industry, we're going to see a lot of inquiries um, to go either into business rescue or informal turnarounds or informal forms of restructuring um yeah so at this stage not as much as i thought we were going to see but i'm giving it another four months um if if you go and have a look at what happened in the 2008 crash um and because i did a study on the court um numbers that they issue when you go and open a case and those case numbers all start with um, 2011. So that took ah. a full three years for guys to only end up in court and get liquidated because they were still sitting with a bit of cash in 08 and 09 and then 2010 and 11, the trouble really started. So by the time it gets, when, by the time it gets to you, would you say it's like seriously dire? People don't yes. look into it. They look no. at every other option possible first. <laughs> they always yeah. come to us too late. That's unfortunately always the case. When is the oh, right the time, time to come to you? Not, yeah, I was going to say, it's not the time now to start coming through. Yes, I would say that they should come through now and that especially directors and owners of, of businesses should let their egos fly out the window and start asking for help because the first couple of red flags are now starting to show on their side. And this is now the time for them to, to put up their hands and say, listen, we need help and advice and we should potentially go into business rescue. They always leave it too late. And Hanko, I've got a qu follow up question, especially around ego. And I'm highlighting this in light of mindfulness, right? Yeah. How would you advise a, a owner of a business to let go of ego? Because at times, you know, we say these things, but, but how? We talk about people need to change mindsets, but how? Mm. Um, so there is a negative stigma attached to the term business rescue. And directors mm. tend to feel like failures when they put their businesses into business rescue. But fortunately, it's been around now for 10 years in South Africa. And that stigma has started to fall away. Um, and it's now become more or less seen to be the honorable thing 
to do when you see and you sit with your auditors and they are usually the guys who come to you as an owner and say that, listen, your statements do not look good and you need to make a plan. Um, so I think the whole stigma that was attached to rescue has started to, to, to fall away. And, um, and directors now start to think um, not only about the employees, but about that heritage that they've built up in their business. It's, it's usually you sit with directors who's built a business over 50, 60 years. And now for them to come and ask for help is usually where the ego gets in the way. Um, but they do tend to, to come for help, um, put the company into business rescue. Um, and a lot of companies come out the other end of business rescue a lot stronger than they were before they went in. Um, which is a great benefit of business rescue. Um, but yeah, I think especially with COVID and the lockdown has really brought um, the owners of companies to their knees. And there are no other, there isn't a way, there's no space for any egos. Um, and that automatically flies out the window. And they just say, listen, um, I'm standing a chance of losing my livelihood and I need help. Not only for me, but my employees as well. And I think from a mindfulness point of view then, I mean, how I would, what I'm hearing is it is getting to a point where you accept what is in the current moment with no judgment. Exactly. That summarizes it very well. And obviously once you do that, that's another way of actually expressing compassion for yourself because failure is inevitable. I mean, we're all in this together and life is, you know, there's ups and downs, but once you accept what is and without any judgment or whatsoever, and then taking it as a learning opportunity, you are able to then access creativity within yourself. And you realize actually there's a whole new way of doing things rather than being stuck in the same way. And yeah. this is why we wanting to combine these topics to mindfulness. That's it. What I've also seen is that with your older businesses that was built up over, say, 40 or 50 years, those directors of those companies will tell you that, listen, I've been through this um, four or five times before. I've been able to, to lift my company out of the ashes and rebuild it and reinvent it. And mm -hmm. this then only turns out to be the fifth or sixth time that they forced to reinvent themselves and their businesses. And fortunately, this time around, um, business rescue is available to them where it wasn't in the past. Mm. And I think that's a very good point. Uh, sorry, Steve. I mean, Hinka, when you say that, it's like business rescue doesn't mean the end of your business. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It actually, it actually can, it's a, it's a tool you can use to revitalize your business. And it's, you know, it's all your perception and your viewpoint around it that will help you and your business move forward. Mm. And I think the communication here is key because communication with others, with your staff, with opening up to a business rescue practitioner, just generally, I think that we're so closed and it's an opportunity now mm. to actually just start communicating honestly and as you say, ask for help if you need it or offer help if you can. I'm finding in my workplace, yesterday alone, one of my employees phoned me and said that she's managed to get food parcels for staff that are really, really battling and asked for their addresses and sent them off. And I thought that was awesome because we're communicating and she's also realizing that her colleagues are battling and she wants to help them, which we've never had before. So I think communication is key here with everything. Absolutely. Rich, you're absolutely right. Because what I've also seen is the business rescue process forces all the affected parties, whether that be your banks, even SARS, it might be your most aggressive and most hostile creditor that you owe money to. It forces all of these people to take part in a process and it forces them to sit around a table with you and brainstorm with you. Um, it, it stops them from giving you a hard time. It keeps the wolves at, at bay and, um, and forces everyone to come together and put their minds together and say, how are we going to rescue this business? And mm -hmm. I've seen that a lot of the knights in shining armor that come to your, 
to your saving is usually your biggest creditor because he knows that if I take part in this process and I in some shape or another help this business by keeping on supplying or entering into new agreements with this company that's in, re in rescue, I at the end of the day will get my money back as well. So it just forces everyone to take part. Um, and I've really seen that it's usually your biggest creditor that, that comes to your savings. Wow. True in saying that as well, but also what it does, is it also gives a lot of transparency on the actual business itself in terms of where creditors always say, ha, the owners have sunk the company to enrich themselves. When you undergo business, undergo business rescue, everything becomes transparent and you showcase every part of the business to your creditors and suppliers and customers. Because when, when, when a practitioner comes into play, he doesn't have any emotional attachments to the business. He's very clinical about, about the process that he wants to follow. And it actually has a lot of buy-in from the creditors, right? Okay? Absolutely. There's no team. bias um, if, if, if an owner has to do it. And just the relief that it brings to the, to the directors and owners of a company when a third person, uh, totally objective from, from the sideline, comes in and just takes that pressure off of the shoulders of the owners and allows the directors to sit mm. back for a while and let someone else come in with, like Kim said, without any emotions attached to it. And a guy or lady who can come in and make hard decisions uh, without any emotions, that usually uh, saves yeah. the, the ship at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. Great. Um, we, I think we can formally start the masterclass. We do have 13 participants with us. Welcome, everyone. Um, and welcome to our third our masterclass. We started off with our very first one in May, which was focusing on evolving your business perspective during and beyond COVID-19. And then we had our second one last week, which was really focusing, and we're going to have more of these right up until the 30th of July, um, which was focusing, which is exactly this one, Mindfulness for Business Innovation and Resilience. So my name is Sipoka Zikwakweni, and I'm going to be a masterclass facilitator. And I'm not alone. I've got other members with me today, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. Handing over to you, Hanko. You can introduce yourself first. Sipokazi, thank you for having me. Um, I reside in Johannesburg and um, I'm running a business rescue and turnaround um, firm uh, now for the past 10 years. We were established in 2011. Um, and yes, uh, that is basically what I've been keeping myself busy with uh, these past 10 years. Thank you. And Kim, we can hear from you. Yeah. My, hi, guys. My name is Kim Ishordal also Johannesburg-based. Uh, I am a business rescue investor and currently the managing director of Mammoth Technologies or the Mammoth Group, together linked with a company called Empower Logic, CE Engineering. And I work quite closely with Henko on investments. Thank you. Trish. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Trish Taylor. I own Life Retreat. And Sipakazi and I offer workshops and masterclasses in the workplace for wellness and mindfulness of the workplace and in the workplace. But Sipakazi will fill you in more on that now. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sipo. Uh, my name is Sasha Muller. I am the convener of the ANC Progressive Business Forum. Uh, the Progressive Business Forum, for those of you who are subscribers, um, would already know um, that we are a ratified uh, program of the ANC, which role is to keep the dialogue or social compact alive between the party, leaders in the party, and business in South Africa, the business community. Uh, the reason why we're such an important organization is because we're not a one-way communication organization. We're about having a dialogue, an interactive dialogue, being able to take information from business and feed it in to the highest level of ANC leaders, which are obviously in governments as well, and be able to influence and get your 
um, influence is the wrong word, but let me rather say, get your insights to participate in the building of policy that helps the stimulation of the economy. So uh, we produce a whole array of reports. We have fantastic events. Um, we do masterclasses like these, uh, workshops, training. And this partnership came along with Life Retreat because us at the PBF ourselves went through a rejuvenation process, um, primarily because we'd been doing things a certain way for 15 years, being a well-established party and a well-established program of the party. And we realized that the world was changing, the business world was changing, and things were moving, 4IR came in, digitalization, but big firms that were becoming really successful were talking about productivity, wellness, you know, the, the sort of lifestyle that was not just all about work. And if you look at the results that Google has been able to produce by bringing in wellness programs, we ourselves went through a wellness program. And I can tell you in since September, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Sipo, we did our course. Um, our whole team of 24 people have completely transformed. We've moved on to digital platforms. We're able now to interact. We've grown as a business and we've been able to innovate as policy has changed. So I hope that courses like this can help others. And today I'm very excited to deal with things, uh, you know, wellness and mindfulness in the sense of, you know, the legal terms around it. Because I think many people think of mindfulness as this wishy-washy, feel-good aspect of things. And Sipo, you're going to explain that it, it really isn't. It's everything that we, we are. And it's the way we do things, the way we look at it. Glass half full, glass half empty. I have a personal life saying, and I'm not sure if everybody does, but I've always had this, this saying that says, um, sometimes in life, you know, it's not how you fail, but it's how you get up after you fall. And always look ahead and prepare for that. And I think the, the term of business rescue is much like that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for that, Sasha. And we're going to jump right into it. I just want to find my presentation right here. So again, this is really to welcome everyone to our hour of mindfulness, innovation, and resilience. And really, this is um, a series of masterclasses that we started already in May. And we had one last week, as I'd mentioned, and we're going to be running through these for the next, um, I think, seven weeks now, every Thursday at 12 midday. And these are all the topics that we're going to be covering, and we will share all of this information with you. So I'm not going to be going through in detail within this presentation, and this is just the schedule. And really mine is to really dive into mindfulness. So we've started talking about mindfulness already within the past two webinars where we defined it, you know, and we also spoke about, we shared the different businesses such as Google who've actually incorporated mindfulness as part of their business culture. And our intention through these sessions is for us to really take it even deeper by just sharing some practical ways in which businesses can introduce mindfulness as we all navigate this newness. And you'll see right in front of you, mindfulness really helps us with a series of areas around our, in our lives, relationships, energy, the body, the brain, our careers, and finances. And if you look at the whole entire picture, to me, it is definitely about livelihoods and lives. And we normally start each and every session with actually a mindful practice. So I'm going to invite you to really indulge me and take advantage of this opportunity to, to be mindful. So we start off with a meditation and I'm gonna become more technical this time as I lead it. And with the slide in front of you, you'll see we've got a breathing exercise, which is called a three-part breathing exercise and a body scan meditation. And by three-part breathing, basically how it's going to work is you're going to inhale nice and slowly through your nose to the count of six, and then you're gonna hold your breath for a count of two, and then you will exhale to the count of eight. Okay? So to do that, I'm going to invite you just to sit back and relax. 
You may close your eyes if you want to. If you're not comfortable with closing your eyes, you may just soften your gaze and just rest and just be present in this moment right here. So, and as you settle into this moment, I invite you to begin by bringing your awareness to your breathing without trying to control your breath. Just allow it just to flow naturally before we do the actual exercise. So become aware of just the natural flow of your breathing. I'm definitely trying to calm mine because it's beating very fast. And how we do that is by then beginning to breathe with intention so slowly inhaling to the count of six. And holding it for the count of two. And then releasing your breath nice and slowly to the count of eight. This is definitely something that you can practice at your own time, at your own space in the office, just to calm yourself. And as you do that, you may then begin to also scan your body just by becoming aware of any sensation that comes up within your body as you breathe in and out. And the reason why we practice mindfulness in this manner, which is really one of the tools, is bringing your awareness into your breath and why when we do that, you are basically removing your attention from the mind chatter. If you look at the picture on the screen, there's a man and a dog walking and you can see the man has got a lot on his mind. And then the dog has got absolutely nothing in his mind, just observing beautiful nature. So this is really an opportunity for us to silence the mind chatter or what we call the monkey mind in mindfulness so that one is able to focus on what is. And when you focus on what is, you're also able just to become aware of all the sensations that come within your body and just really checking in with yourself. As human beings, we live on autopilot where we're just simply doing things without being mindful. And the whole purpose of mindfulness is for us to be able to really check in with ourselves. So the next slide looks at really what, you know, just checking in. And this is something that we do in my practice and where I work as well, where when we have a meeting, we literally just check in with each other. And we've done it with as well with the PBF where at the beginning of any meeting, after a meditation or after a moment of stillness, you check in physically. So how are you feeling physically? And obviously once you've spent time engaging and just listening to your body, you should know how you're feeling physically. And how are you feeling emotionally, intellectually and spiritually? So that's another tool that I'm sharing with you today. And if I can also just demonstrate how we normally check in. So one would say, after your meditation, physically, like right now, I'm feeling a bit, a bit cold, um, but I should be fine as we get right into this. Intellectually, I'm ready for the session. I have been ready since 4 a.m. this morning, very excited. And emotionally, I'm very happy and very content. But also what's making me happy is that my daughter turned 10 yesterday. And spiritually, I'm forever connected and forever grateful. So that is an example of checking in. But we always encourage people to check in however they want to check in. And the reason we do that, it also gives you an opportunity to see where people are at. You know, as human beings, a lot happens in our lives. And if one comes to work and they've gone through a lot, once you check in, you get to see where they're at. And then in that way, you'll know how to engage with a person throughout the day. And then the other part of, of mindfulness is really gratitude. There's always something to be grateful for. And especially during these difficult times, whether it's in business, whether it's work, I mean, it could be anything. We're grateful for life itself. And I love the focus on being grateful for your breath because really life starts with the breath. Um, being grateful the fact for, for a business that is there to be rescued. So there's many things to be grateful for. So it really allows us the opportunity to take stock of what really matters and what really exists in this current moment rather than dwelling in the past, which is no longer there, or focusing in the future, which has not even arrived yet. And lastly, it's all about setting an intention. 
you know, you get up every day, you just get out of bed and you just simply go on autopilot. But what is your intention for getting up? What is your intention for your business? What is your intention for each and everything that you're doing? So mindfulness also gets us into a practice of being intentional about each and everything that we're doing, whether you are walking, whether you are breathing, whether you're risking your business, whatever it is, it's about really setting an intention. And here's the picture that I showed earlier again, where you have someone on the left-hand side who has a lot in their mind. And when you live in your mind, you miss out on the current moment, which is the only moment that really exists right now. And then you see the person on the right-hand side, they are really in the moment, taking in the beautiful trees and the sun, you know? And this is really where, this is where you are able to, to, to tap into your creativity because there's nothing that's clouding your mind. And again, just to go back to some definitions of white mindfulness. So mindfulness is the simple act of focusing all your attention to the present moment. The other definition is in being intentional about your attention. So being intentional about what you pay attention to. So um, if you look at also the mind, if you focus on the negative and you are intentional about focusing on the negative, you are bound to start feeling crap actually. But if you are intentional about focusing on the positive, the things that you are grateful for, the things that are working, then you are bound to start feeling a bit good about anything that may be bothering you. And mindfulness is a tool that helps us change our mindsets and really grow our thinking, you know? And COVID-19 is really forcing us to start thinking differently. You know, things like washing hands that we took for granted is very important. Hygiene, spending time with our family, um, I mean, some of us now have had to work remotely and we've had to manage households, all kinds of things, which has been stretching us. And you could either approach that from a place of anxiety and complaining, or you could actually see the benefits and the stuff that we can be grateful for in this process. And I think for me, one of my favorite things about mindfulness is the combination of the brain and heart and compassion. You know, we do tend to work a lot on logic, you know, and just really working with the mind without really coming back into our heart space. And for me, this is also a true example of balancing lives and livelihoods. And why is mindfulness a superpower? And why is mindfulness important at a corporate level and at individual level? So I'm gonna start unpacking this. So stress is obviously one of the major things. I mean, we are all going through stressful moments. It's whether it's a business that's failing, whether you are fearful of returning to work now that we're, I mean, now that the regulations are, or the lockdown is being relaxed. So there's many things to be stressed about. You may, you may have lost your job. You've got children who are sitting at home or not going to school. There's many kinds of things. And stress can be good because obviously it motivates us, but also stress can be quite detrimental to our health. And there are many causes of stress. I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but I mean, currently we are all sitting in a very stressful situation where there's so much uncertainty in life. Now, how can mindfulness help us in navigating our stress? Now, mindfulness helps us with increased performance and also creativity. I'm just trying to see the bigger picture because the slides, the pictures next to me are just covering that. It also improves our immune system well-being and happiness and better decision making and really it also gives us the opportunity just to stop and really reflect and think about things and think about thinking and again setting intentions as to how we want to navigate this uncertainty and this unknown world that we find ourselves in again the other benefits of mindfulness help us become self-aware with no judgment, actually, accepting yourself as you are. And whether you're failing or not, the reality is that we all go through challenges in life and it allows us to really act with compassion towards ourselves and others. It's, it helps with relationship management. Um, we spoke about transparency here and communication, social awareness and emotional balance rather than allowing stress just to take over. And individual benefits that one may experience when it comes to mindfulness is increased problem solving skills, confidence, acceptance of criticism, because we're not perfect. I mean, nobody is perfect. That's the reality of it. Um, and we also find ourselves now in a situation that's actually not perfect. And we're all in this together. It improves our memory, our focus and attention skills. It reduces anger and hostility. 
It increases compassion, self-compassion and compassion for others. It boosts our immune system and prevents stress eating and all, all kinds of other stress-related habits that people may actually start experiencing. Now, some examples of how mindfulness can be brought into the business and into your workplace or even into your daily life. Trisha and I are both yoga teachers and we own yoga studios as well, Life Retreat and the Ocean Movement Studio. And this is definitely where we've been able to deepen our mindfulness. And this is why we're even sharing um, this whole concept of mindfulness with the, with the bigger world. And um, so through having wellness classes, whether it's yoga, tai chi, um, and then designated quiet spaces where people can actually go into a space of stillness where they can actually recharge and rejuvenate. Um, where you can also offer group guided or silent meditation. I'm a meditation teacher as well. And my practice really helps to ground me, you know, and as you start the day so that you can start your day with intention. And also when you're ending your day, it's also a great way just to come into a space of stillness and just keeping, you know, just silencing the mind chatter and letting go of any baggage or anything that may not serve you as you go forward. Um, by also creating supplies and activities. I mean, there's so many ways that one can actually introduce mindfulness into business, starting meetings with mindful activities as we did, and also, you know, checking in as we also did. And then again, having such lectures, like guest lectures speaking on mindfulness. The bottom line, basically, of what I'm trying to share with you is that mindfulness can save your company money and resources, and it can also help create a healthier and happy and content team. And again, you'll find that when it comes to stress management, here are some of the things that are being suggested and meditation, deep breathing is one of them that you'll find. And here's another tool of mindfulness, which is quite basic. And as I've said, we are gonna avail all of these to you, the presentation, so that you can also just go through these tools that we are sharing with you. And lastly, I just want to share some feedback that Trish and I had gotten from the PBF when we met with them last year in September, when they experienced mindfulness for the first time. And I'm not going to go through everything, but here's one where one says, first time I was introduced to mindfulness, I found it informative and well presented. I intend to start practicing aspects that I've learned. Um, it was good to learn more, to be more aware of others' needs in the workspace. It is okay to face and deal with your own shortcomings. Through mindfulness, one can be able to tolerate one another's difference at work and at home. And then um, the other one was too nice to know meditation can help with work. So we've, these are some of the feedback that we've received um, from people who've participated within our programs. And lastly, I just want to leave you with this, that mindfulness is not difficult. We just need to remember to do it. And what you may find is that in, 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 in our lives, mindfulness is something that you're doing. Whether you're exercising, whether you're taking a walk, there's always opportunities just to practice mindfulness. And I will leave it right there with this beautiful still picture. And if you can just look at the water and which is just purely calm. And my hope is that as one journeys into this concept of mindfulness, we can find ourselves in a space of calm where our minds are just as calm and where we can actually access our resources of creativity. And thank you very much everyone for listening to my presentation. And I'm going to hand over to Henko now. Let me just stop the share. Great. Thank you, Sivakasi. Thank um, you. Sivakasi, so on one of your slides, you've just shown us that part of, the, of being mindful or part of mindfulness is also to acquire skills for problem solving. And that is what Business Rescue will, will bring to the table um, for, for your viewers. Business Rescue, the, the best I can explain it usually for a client who walks through the doors of of our company um, Stearns, not to be mistaken for the jewelry store Stearns, we we spelt it slightly different than, than the jewelry store Stearns, um, is how I explain business rescue to them is you get a third party in from the outside to, and if I can show you here, a teacup. Um, if your business is in business rescue, think of it as, a teacup with tea inside 
And our approach at Stearns with Business Rescue is to save the tea inside and not the cup. So what I mean by that is Business Rescue will allow you to, if the tea inside is your intellectual property, um, the history of your business, your cash flow, your assets, your employees, we save what's inside and we change the cup on the outside. You can either transfer the tea from the one cup into a different cup. So we change the mold and the shape of the company on the outside. You can add colors to it. You can change the shape. You can change the size of the company, but you preserve the value of the tea that's inside. And that is what Business Rescue, which has been around for the past 10 years, is, 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 is allowing companies who are finding themselves in distress. That's, that's what it's allowing them, them to do. So if your viewers can see the, the one page slide that you've just put up, um, I'll spend a minute on each of those nine points, which will, which will take up my, my 10, 10 minutes of, of chatting to you about the specific topic of business rescue. Um, first and foremost, your company must be in, in financial distress. And how do you test that? You ask yourself one of two questions. Um, will I be able, will my company be able to, within the next six months, um, pay all of its debts and commitments as they fall due? So that focuses on your cash flow. The second is, Will, I be, will my company be able to, within the next six months, um, still have its assets um, exceed its liabilities? So the first question of the cash flow in law, legal terms, they usually talk about, is your business still commercially, commercially solvent? Focusing on cash flow, can I pay all of my commitments as they fall due within the next six months? The second one is, is my company still technically solvent? Will my assets always exceed my liabilities for the next six months? If your answer is yes to one of those two questions, then yes, your business is financially distressed. The next question on that slide that you would have to ask yourself is whether there is a reasonable prospect of rescuing my business. If there isn't a reasonable prospect, then I can't go for business rescue. So you need two things to answer this question of whether there is, whether a reasonable prospect exists for rescuing my business. There must be reasonable grounds for believing that there is a reasonable prospect. And secondly, you must be able to demonstrate um, that it is probable that you will be able to save this, bus this company if you do put it into business rescue. Um, the goals of Business Rescue, there are two main goals. You restructure the affairs of your company so that you can, number one, return it to solvability. Get it solvent again. If you can't do that, then at least number two is you must aim to provide a higher payout or a higher dividend to your creditors than they would receive if you put your company into liquidation today. Those are the two aims of business rescue. Number one, get the restru restructure the affairs, redesign the teacup so that the company will continue to trade on a solvent basis. If not, number two, restructure your affairs in such a way that you can at least pay your creditors a lot more than they would receive if you uh, put the lock on the doors today and, uh, and close your business. Um, number four, just quickly, how the business rescue process works. If you do put your business into, into rescue, um, the main benefit is that you get temporary supervision of your company. And that supervision is taken by a third party who comes in, a business rescue practitioner. Secondly, a huge benefit of the business rescue process is what they call in law um, a temporary moratorium on any legal action against your business. So um, it keeps the wolves at bay. Um, creditors can't act on their rights by suing you, liquidating you, um, and dragging you to court. It forces them to take part in a business rescue process, forces them 
to come and sit around a table with you and the business rescue practitioner and come up with a plan on how you're going to save your business so that at the end of the day, you can pay your creditors back. And then thirdly, part of the business rescue process is the development of a business plan, a business rescue plan. In that plan, you um, tell your creditors and all affected parties how you're going to save this business. And at the end of the day, it's the business rescue practitioner's job to go and sell this idea to all the creditors so that they, at the end of the day, buy into your idea and vote for your business plan, which then, once they voted for it, becomes a binding contract between your company, the business rescue practitioner, and all of your creditors. Number five on this slide is how do you start business rescue if you do decide to go for this option? Two ways, either voluntarily by your directors passing a resolution saying that they think business rescue is the best option for them to save this business. That's very quick, that's very easy. By passing a resolution on paper, you then submit it to the CIPC who processes it and, um, and puts your company into business rescue. The second way of going into business rescue is only by an order of court. And that is when one of your hostile or more aggressive creditors feel that the best way for them to get payment out of your company is by them approaching the court directly and telling a judge that, listen, dear judge, we need that company to be put into business rescue. We need a business rescue practitioner to rearrange his affairs so that we, as the biggest or largest creditor, can at least get our money out of them. So those are the two ways of, of um, going into business rescue. Number six, on this slide is to choose your business rescue practitioner um, very wisely, because you will especially now see um, during the lockdown period and after the, the COVID-19 period that every second person will put up his hand and say, I'm equipped to become a business rescue practitioner. The business rescue industry is not as uh, good, uh, um, um, governed as it should be. Um, so you might find a few fly by nights in the industry going around. So what I would recommend here is usually it's either your auditors or your, your in-house legal or counsel outside who would say to you that, listen, you need to consider putting your company into business rescue and let yourself be guided by those guys and referrals of who they've used in the past to appoint um, a successful business rescue practitioner. Number seven on this slide is, what is the role of your creditors should you put your own business into, into business rescue? This would entail your creditors to lodge a claim with the business rescue practitioner, to prove to the business rescue practitioner that your company actually owes so much rand and cents to them. It will allow your creditors to participate in meetings and to have their say as well um, as to how they see your company should be saved. And it gives them a lot of voting power, your creditors, because they at the end of the day will vote on the plan that is presented to them by the business rescue practitioner. The creditors will vote according to the RAND value that they are owed. So it's not an individual per person vote. It's about the RAND amount that you owe that specific creditor. That is the weight that their vote will carry in seeing your, your business plan through. Um, number eight on my slide is success stories of business rescue. We've had many. Um, your viewers and subscribers shouldn't be deterred or put off by the national statistics that they will read about business rescue. Um, I think if you go and Google now, you will see that in South Africa, business rescue has a success rate of say 20%. But um, especially in a company like ours, where we exclusively focus on the turnaround of businesses, we tend to be very picky about the ones that we do take on, uh, which assignments and which matters we, we accept. Because you do get nominated by the CIPC um, as these cases come across their desk 
and then the CIPC would ask you, do you accept this appointment as a business rescue practitioner? And you can then say yes or no. So we tend to be very picky about the ones we, we take on. We make sure that there is a reasonable prospect to save this business before we accept the appointment. And that is at the end of the day, made sure that our company has had um, a success rate of in excess of 75, almost 80% um, of successful rescues on all the matters that we've taken on. Um, one of the reasons I've also asked Kim to join us um, on this panel of speakers is because, one of, because his business, um, his company was one of the success stories that we did um, about five years ago. Um, so yes, in short, I will hand it over to, to Kim so he can maybe tell you the benefits that his company enjoyed um, from Business Rescue. But in summary, if your business and you need breathing space um, and, and need an expert to come in and restructure the affairs of your business and save the tea and not the cup, then Business Rescue is, is definitely a great option um, to go for. It's been around now for 10 years. It was implemented and rolled out in South Africa on the 1st of May in 2011. Um, so we've been around the block. Um, a lot of case law has been built up over these last 10 years, which has made Business Rescue really a viable option. And um, maybe Business Rescue was specifically designed now for, for a time like this, um, as such as COVID-19, where owners and directors of businesses are really uh, feeling the pinch and are brought down to their knees um, because of the lockdown. So thank you, Sipo. If I can hand over to Kim and we can hear um, what his experience was when we did the business rescue for his company five years ago. Over to you, Kim. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. So yeah, so initially it was very scary. Uh, firstly, for us to actually admit responsibility as to where we were as a company. And we almost ran out of ideas and we ran out of personal funding to put back into the business. And when we met with uh, Stan, Hanko and Carol, they were very open as to the approach and the fact that they, they just, which we had to acknowledge and understand. So upon acknowledgement and understanding of that, with their experience and knowledge, we were able to self-rescue our business by interacting with our customers, our key customers, our key suppliers. And we were able to settle all our debts about 18 months down the line in full. And today we stand quite strong as a company, but constantly looking at where we could have ended up if we did not have that guidance from a business rescue practitioner. Um, it was not uh, the, the cost to get us back alive, let's call it that way, uh, or to get the fees that we had to pay to Stearns was marginal compared to where we are at the moment today. Today we stand as a global company, whereas if you go back five years, we would have been a liquidated company. So yeah, Business Rescue is actually a very positive uh, way for companies to go. Um, when you have very few options. Yeah. Kim, um, if I can add to that, one of the questions from one of the viewers is what the costs are that, that's involved with Business Rescue. And you've just pointed out that um, you had one of two choices. Either you sit today with a globally strong international company, or you would have sat with nothing, mm -hmm. a liquidated company. And if you had to weigh Absolutely. up the costs that were involved, even a liquidation of a company is very expensive. Um, if you were to liquidate your business today, a yeah. liquidator would take 10% of your asset value immediately. So what we usually do is we give this comparison to the client and say, if you were to liquidate today, this is what, a liquid, what the liquidation process will cost versus what the business rescue will cost you for the next year, say. Um, but the business rescue industry is um, 
costed at prescribed rates, which is reflected in the Companies Act, um, and that is 1,250 Rand per hour. It might be a bit higher depending on the size of your business, um, but that is the prescribed rate um, currently in the Companies Act, is 1,250 per hour um, to come in. That amount can be capped as well. And what we've also seen is usually when clients come to us, they say, this is my budget. This is what I want you to cap your costs at. And thus, this is what I would like to get out of business rescue. And this is what I can spend. And then we keep to that. Um, but you will see, uh, and uh, I have mentioned some flyby nights in the industry. They go to exorbitant fees. Um, we've seen guys get appointed on business rescue matters where the company would in business rescue end up what we call in the industry a zombie company. It's literally a company just lingering in business rescue for years and years on end and not getting anywhere and costing the client a lot of money. Without it, The ideal business rescue is one where you can go in, fix what's broken and get out at, the, at, at minimum cost. Um, but that is what, it, what business rescue costs um, at the moment. Thank you for that, Tenko. I think Kim wanted to say something. Kim, are you saying something there? Okay, it seems like we've lost Kim. And then Trish, are there any other questions while we're waiting for Kim to rejoin? I don't know whether you saw this one, Henko, but I would like to know how amounts owed to SARS by a business, income tax, pay, VAT, etc., are treated in a business rescue process. Does SARS have to vote on the business rescue process and do amounts owing have to be paid in full if a business comes out of a business rescue and resumes trading? Okay, Trish. So, so let's break this SARS-related question up a little bit um, into, into two or three questions. So number one is, um, if, you, if you were to place your company into liquidation, then SARS would have been what we call a preferred creditor. SARS would have been at the top of the picking order when it comes to paying out the estate to your creditors. Whereas in business rescue, that ranking turns upside down. In business rescue, SARS is what we call a concurrent normal creditor. And they carry as much weight as any other of your creditors. Um, their voting power will depend on the size of the amount that is owed to SARS. Um, what we've found recently is that SARS is very pro business rescue because they want to see that jobs are being saved during the business rescue process. And at the end of the day, they want to recoup some of the, the, the money that is owed to them as well. And business rescue allows for this. Um, what is nice about business rescue and SARS is quite amenable to this is that you can suggest that your creditors take a haircut on the amount that is owed to them. So instead of repaying every cent that you owe all of your creditors, you ask them nicely that they rather accept 70% of what is owed to them. And we've seen SARS accept uh, these proposals in, in mostly all of our cases. Um, so yes, that's two parts of the question that I received. Yes, SARS definitely votes on your business rescue plan that you put forward. Um, and no, not always all of the SARS debt is repaid in full. Um, there are other clauses involved when you do offer them a compromised amount, like saying, dear SARS, I will, would like to pay you 60% of what I owe you. There are other implications like what they call a VAT clawback on historic VAT and so on, but that is dealt with separately. Um, and, and we found that SARS is, is very amenable to, to business rescue. And because they want to see that the business is saved and they want to see that a business that used to contribute to society and to, to the economy, that it be saved. 
because that is also part of the business that they in is contributing to to government um so if i hope that that answers the SARS question and may i ask you another question please henko if somebody would like to make their business dormant to so say it's a restaurant that could be dormant for a few months and have the possibility of opening up again do they decide that on their own or do they come to a business rescue practitioner how do they go about it i think it would be best for them to either approach the the legal counsel for legal advice or to come to a business rescue practitioner and to think of 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 all of the options that there are um what i have seen lately is that like you say trish yes many companies uh, especially your smaller ones just close the doors for 3 months and they they say it's because of covid and they shutting the doors they sending everyone back home and saying please stay home uh we're making this business dormant and we'll call you back to come back to work after say 4 months or 5 months i have seen that lately but it would be best to rather just come for proper advice on on what to do because there are a host of other implications if you just close the doors and stop operations and not pay your your vat you pay as you earn even your salaries to your employees which are all entitled to so um that that's a a more uh, involved question uh, so yes thank you and uh, let's see here can you file for business rescue based on claims often unproven outstanding by say customers or employees commissions etc so so um if if you voluntarily as an owner of a business would like to file for business rescue then no um you as soon as you go into business rescue it becomes a business rescue practitioner's duty to quantify all of your liabilities and all of the claims that that you owe to your creditors part of the business rescue process is to tidy things up and to invite your creditors to prove to you how much you owe to them so all claims must always be proven you will always see that part of a a claim submission is where your creditors must have the claim commissioned by a commissioner of oath as well as the supporting document and invoices showing that this is truly what you are owed um the second one if you as a creditor approach the court and ask the judge to place someone who owes you money into business rescue so that you can get your money back then definitely when you approach the judge you would have to prove that this is what you are owed and why you would like him or her to put that business into business rescue so definitely claims must always be proven I have another interesting question here. What is the role of lo- labor in the business rescue process, especially if owed salaries are they treated as creditors as well? Yes. So the Labor Relations Act goes hand in hand with the Companies Act. Um the Labor Relations Act there we protect the employees and look after the employees. The Companies Act regulates the business rescue part of of saving the business. um so employees are protected at all times um by the companies act as well as the labor relations act they if they are owed any sal- outstanding salaries then they become a creditor um and what we like to do when we conduct business rescues is to make employees what we call preferred creditors in business rescue you have three categories Number 1 is you have secured creditors that's usually your banks any claim of theirs that's backed or secured with with something either personal surety that was signed or backed by assets so that makes them secured creditors secondly preferred creditors that is usually your employees if they are owed so outstanding salaries and then after preferred we get to concurrent creditors that's usually your trade creditors and that's the way that they get paid out as well out of your estate is in that picking order 
I'll give you one last question. Which law regulates practitioners and how do business owners know that the practitioner is regulated? How would we know where to go? So um, in South Africa, business rescue practitioners are either members of um, uh, the governing body by the name of SARIPA or the governing body TMA. Um, one of those two. So, and, and those are the two big brothers who watch our, our shoulders and make sure that we do what we're supposed to do. Thirdly, the CIPC also regulates us. CIPC is the, is the company's um, commissioner, so they make sure that they vet you in any event, so they issue you with a license to practice as a business rescue practitioner. And it is, you can either then go to the CIPC or to one of those two governing bodies, SARIPA or the TMA, to complain um, about a specific business rescue practitioner. And they can then either revoke your membership or revoke your license to practice as one. Um, so it's those three. And then, of course, the Companies Act is very specific on the duties of a business rescue practitioner. Um, it's in ch specifically Chapter 6 of the Companies Act. They say exactly what your duties as a practitioner is. And if you skip on one of those duties, then uh, you will find your creditors um, go and complain to either the CIPC or the TMA or SARIPA. Awesome. So I have um, another comment here that's quite interesting. We can go back a little bit to our mindfulness. Is I've just received an email from someone thanking us so much for the last couple of webinars. And since she's attended them, she said she's changed her whole mindset. And her business has turned around. She is so busy that she can't make this webinar. Could we please send her recording? <laughs> so that's awesome to hear that you know, people are benefiting from mindfulness and from our experts' advice. It's really awesome. Thank you, Trish. And there, yes. Just to add on to that, I think um, from what Henko was saying earlier on, I liked how you were referring to the cup, right? and obviously going within the cup. And as a yoga practitioner and as a mindfulness teacher, that's exactly what we aim to do when it comes to our practice. Really, yoga or even mindfulness is an opportunity to go within, right? And where you're going within at all levels within. And again, where you get to discover really what's inside you in this current moment, rather than focusing on the outside noise, which can be very distracting. So I really loved how you obviously used that, that example because that's exactly what we're also trying to aim. And really, once you get yourself right, then it also trickles into the rest of your life, whether it's in business, whether it's in work, and so on. And I mean, as you've mentioned that now business rescue is also starting to become more relevant, especially during this crisis. Last week we had, we were talking about digitization, all of these concepts that have been around just lurking in the back, you know, with no form of urgency, are becoming more and more and more necessary and more important in the current context. And this is exactly what we aim to achieve through these platforms by sharing, obviously, your expert advice, your experience, our experience, and also hearing from other businesses as to how they are navigating this newness, but obviously with the focus on mindfulness, innovation, and resilience. And I think with that, I just really also want to take the time to thank both of you for really participating and really joining us and sharing your expertise and your experience as well, Kim. And really our intention is to motivate and find solutions in this new normal rather than focusing on the actual problems. And we've got a couple more minutes. I see, I think there's another question. Oh, it's thank yous. Gratitude, thank you. Um, and really just a reminder for everyone, we will be back again next week, same time, same place, um, for another hour of mindfulness, innovation, and resilience. And really our main intention is for us to find the solutions that are needed rather than dwelling in the negative. And I'd really like to thank you for joining us. And normally in a yoga or mindful practice, I would say thank you for sharing your practice with us. Um, Trish, let me hand over to you just for some closing remarks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. 
And please hop on board next week. We've got some exciting stuff on going online and marketing businesses, how to change your mindset. And also please give us feedback so that we actually know what business owners need and require. Because the more feedback you can give us and comments, the more we can actually get experts on to advise you. And Henko and Kim, thank you. That was awesome. It was just so beautifully put across and I think everybody got great value out of it. We really, really appreciate your gift to us. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you always for your mindfulness. Thank you. And then just next week we'll be focusing on how to digitize your business. So we're looking forward to that topic. And yes, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for our hour. And I mean, this is the beautiful thing about the new normal. You know, um, I I also work within the training and development space. And we're also getting into this whole new model of learning, which is called micro learning, rather than going into class for hours or for days and years. And I think what is needed right now is for us to, you know, to keep learning. And this is also why my organization is called the Lifelong Learning Academy. It is really to promote ongoing learning and it is really needed in this current moment. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. One or two more questions. I don't know if you've got a minute or two, Henko, if you'd like to just answer. It's always nice if people can get their answers before they run away. Mm. They're awesome. Um, okay, Trish. So the next question I see from your side is um, from Graham who asks, do you have the same vote on your loan account as the owner? Um, the short answer to that is um, your, the, the weight that your vote will carry is equal to the rand amount of that loan, um, which, which the company owes you as the owner. Um, but it usually becomes in a business rescue what we call a subordinated claim. So we we acknowledge your your loan account we acknowledge that claim that you've put in against your own company and which your own company owes you but we subordinate it and put it at the bottom of the list we first look after all of your other creditors and repay them and then we'll start cracking away at at repaying you which your company owes owes you directly but your vote does count as the owner um it gets uh, tallied and voted on and thrown into the hat as well uh, in the approval of a business to get a business rescue plan approved. But there are other sections of the act that make sure where they say that when you pass a vote on a business plan, that at least 50% of the RAND value must be made up of your independent creditors. You as the owner of the business and having a loan account against your own company will be regarded a dependent creditor and not independent like the rest of your trade creditors. So the act makes sure that if you are owed a huge amount of money by your own company, that you can't swing the votes in getting your own business plan approved and implemented to save your own company. It specifically says that make sure that at least 50% of the rent value who vote for or against your business plan comprise of your independent that's your trade creditors and not not just yourself um it the act was very clever when they wrote that company's act and they made sure that an owner of a company can't just save his own ass instead of the 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 rest of the creditors this is a creditor driven process uh it is there it's designed to give to your creditors more than they would have received had you closed shop um, and that is what we shouldn't forget. That's the main purpose of business rescue. Look after your creditors first. Trisha, are there any other questions? None. I don't okay. think so. I think that's about it, Hinko. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you to everyone for tuning in and just joining the webinar. And we're looking forward to the rest of the series with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, Henka. Thanks, Kim. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.